to design uh, a digital memorial. Good morning. Um, it's nice not to get the death slot, which is, I guess, everybody in the room usually gets given the slot just after lunch or just at the end of the day because a comedian thinks it's funny to give us the death slot. So it's nice to be first thing in the morning. Um, so I'm going to talk through the one of the areas of my research, and this was funded by the EPSRC for with a personal fellowship from 2011 to 14. But before I start, so my research focus, I my background really is human computer interaction, um, and looking at very much interdisciplinary technology research, but grounded still in computer science, human computer interaction. And I have various projects looking at different points in the human lifespan, but this is a death conference, so we know which, which point we're looking at. In case you're wondering, I know there's some people from abroad, so I come from there, and we're somewhere down here, yeah. she said vaguely. <coughs> Because my geography of England isn't as good as my geography of Scotland. So in this talk, I'm going to examine the ways in which we're increasingly living our aspects of our lives digitally. Um, I'm going to set the scene by explaining what I mean by a digital life and compare it with human physical and social lifespans. And then obviously consider what happens when we die. Then I'm going to move on very briskly to... Um, to describe an emergent framework for digital memorials and a case study that we used to test the framework and some refinements we've made since to the framework. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. So the first thing to say is that our physical, social and digital lives aren't always in sync and I, I'll explain what I mean by that. So physical life you'd think was straightforward except you know, when does it actually start? So there's a lack of precision even about when physical life starts. So, so this is a slide of a IVF um, fertilization. So does someone's physical life start when the needle goes into the egg? Does it start when the pregnancy is announced? Does it start when the baby's born? Does it end when you stop breathing? What about if you're on a respirator? So these things are very unclear, even things that seem obvious at first. It's the same with social life in some ways. Does one's social identity and interaction begin um, when a mother first becomes aware of her pregnancy and starts talking to the baby that's in her uterus? Is it when a baby's born? Is it when a baby makes its own first friends independently of its parents? And towards the end, we know that social identity can wither before someone actually physically dies if they're isolated in the care home, for example. Or it may live on after they die, when people still talk about you after you've passed away. And then when you add in digital lives to the mix, it gets more complicated still. Um, so while we're anchored in our offline physical and social lives, our digital lives may not always be in sync. Digital life can predate the landmark event of a birth. So for example, if you have a sonogram of a baby's heartbeat in the uterus, there's digital evidence of that baby, and there's files about it. Um, digital life quickly becomes a multifaceted one, representing aspects of an individual's identity <coughs> through, <coughs> excuse me, through the user's real name, but also through pseudonymous identities online and anonymous identities as well. I guess most of us in the room have more than one digital identity. I certainly do. Some of these identities aren't necessarily tethered to our physical or social selves. So I have a number of fake IDs for testing social media that have nothing to do with me as a person. So taken as a whole, the multiple digital identities create a digital life constructed from the content that the individual creates, participates in, or that references them. And it can be made up of photos, blogs, emails, video, music, and more. And this data is all over the place. Of course, it's not just on your laptop. It might be in the cloud. It might be stored in the bank or in the, the National Health Service. So it's very scattered. It's very hard to switch it off. So how do you close down a digital life? There isn't actually an off switch. 
you'd have to access multiple service providers. So it's quite a complicated process. So we can linger on indefinitely in cyberspace. Probably the most likely way to die online is just to drift down the search rankings. When nobody looks for me anymore, that's when I'll be digitally dead. When Google doesn't actually return this Wendy Monker first. And we keep hanging about in cyberspace. I, this was from yesterday. The print's too small. But this was a memorial on David Bowie's Facebook page, which is open, so you can see all the memorial comments. But the first person to hit the like button on this was David Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he wasn't cremated after all. <laughs> so we can persist online, even after we've died physically and socially. We can hang about. So in that context, so I wanted to kind of set the scene about how problematic the space even is of dying digitally before we talk about digital memorials. So the practice of creating digital memorials is an emergent one. So the, the next chunk of my talk is about the emergent framework that I produced with Dave Kirk at Newcastle. Um, and this was done in response really to us doing our own work and saying, well, how the heck do you design a memorial looking for material out there in the academic domain? And there wasn't anything. So we thought it'd be a good idea to write a paper about it as a kind of thinking tool for ourselves. Previous work, certainly in the academic domain, there was some web-based memorialization. There was some digital memorials as entertainment, um, and there was a little bit of reflective design about memorials and what they should be. It's a really broad space. So this is, I guess a lot of you will be familiar with this, this is the AIDS quilt laid out in the States. It's huge. Each one's made of one square about an individual, but each square is very different. There's a brief about what you have to do with your square, and then it's added to the quilt. So the design problem of producing a digital memorial can be really complex, and you can produce a huge memorial, a very small one, it takes a lot of understanding across disciplines, which I think is one of the really good things about this conference here, is there's lots of different disciplines, because there's lots of different aspects to death. <coughs> so this is a summary of the framework that we produced, and I'll just, I'll work through it. Um, so we, we very much set this up as an emergent framework, as a think piece that should be tested, and I'd welcome feedback at the end of the talk of things you think I've missed, things that could be added, and any different experiences you've had in producing any kind of digital memorial. I'm going to use the, the poppy throughout this as a, because it's a really commonly understood metaphor about loss during the war. Um, so the first thing is actors. So who are the actors involved in digital memorials? Well, there's Somebody's got to make it, and somebody's got to experience it, because otherwise it doesn't really do anything. And the authors can be an individual, it can be multiple, it may be an institution. The deceased may even produce their own memorial. I think we were talking about this last night, about you know, there's some people who, speculatively, maybe they need <coughs> a lot of control, even over their post-self. If you have a single memorial, there's very much a limited perspective. Stacey was saying yesterday about you get a deep insight into one person's perspective on the deceased. You're not an expert in the deceased, you're an expert in somebody else's view of them. But if you have multiple voices involved in being authors of the memorial, of course then you've got conflict when different people have different perspectives of the deceased. If you have institutions, of course you have a political aspect, <coughs> for instance, memorials to the 911, some of them are quite, uh, the Twin Towers attack, are quite politi <coughs> politicised. So inevitably the message conveyed by a memorial is going to be shot through by the intentions of the author or authors. Who experiences the memorial? Well this is a photo of the Vietnam War Memorial. And one of the things I find interesting about it is that over time the audience for this is going to change. So at the start, it's quite a personal memorial as well as a public one. This guy is mourning a specific friend who died during the war. 
but this guy himself is going to die. And it's a very public memorial, so over time the, the audience for this memorial will change from being public and private to just being public. What do you put into a memorial? One of the factors is, sub well, two factors, subject and circumstance. <coughs> so, a memorial can be to a person, it might be to a place or an event. So this <coughs> memorial here is on the D-Day <coughs> landing speeches in France. So there's a combination of things, it's remembering the event and the lives lost. If you think of the death of Princess Diana, a memorial to her would be quite different to memorials to the death of, of the Queen Mother who died aged, aged, I think, 102, with a grand history of testing out British gin. So if we have the Queen Mother's death was expected, it was timely, you know, 102, good innings. It wasn't tragic or traumatic, and yet Princess Diana's death was unforeseen, premature. It was seen as very tragic and traumatic. So the difference means there's a difference in the kind of memorials that are produced. And this is offline. What about the content that makes up a memorial? So this is the images of work by a, a person called Haras Anon, who created a digital memorial cemetery. And his idea was to have a memory stick for each person with their important personal data on it. But content can be made up of memories, material elements, material possessions. It can even be made up of the body. So if we think of relics from the Middle Ages, the memorial included elements of the body in it. So what form should a memorial take? <coughs> it needn't be a website or an app. It needn't be static, it could be evolving. So this is work by Michel Gowler, Digital Remains it's called, and what I find interesting about this is that it only works at a specific geographic location. <coughs> so it's, yes it's a memorial, yes it's digital, there's digital data in this artefact, but it's also a beautifully crafted artefact, so there's some, something tangible about it, something beautiful, and it only functions if you go to a particular place on a particular date. So there's aspects of temporality in place about it. There's also a wholly digital version of the Vietnam War, War Memorial. It's a second life one. So people that can't afford to go to the actual memorial are able to go in second life and visit the War Memorial. So there's interesting aspects around democracy of access to that memorial. Should a memorial be concrete? Should it be something you can touch? Or could it be just a performance? So this is the silence in London on Armistice Day. It's just as much a memorial as a statue or a bunch of poppies laid at a, a stone memorial. But it's an action. And of course memorials don't have to be static. So this one is poppies thrown into the fountain in... Um, I think it's Trafalgar Square, again on <coughs> Armistice Day. It's very different kinds of memorials, but all with the same kind of intent about remembering. <coughs> what message should a memorial convey? So the intentionality may be um, cultural, it may be personal, it may be secular or sacred memorials. So cultural messages can include a positive reframing of loss of life. They may be about allocation of guilt. They may be raising awareness of civic concerns. So for example, I think someone had a picture up yesterday of the death of the um, white bike. Yeah, so that's to highlight deaths from uh, its cyclists killed in motor, motor, motor accidents. So if you walk along the street, you see a bike tethered to, to the railings and it's painted white. It's a, a cyclist died there. So it's a way of raising civic concern. You can also preserve knowledge. So in the HCI domain, uh, 
um, Bachir Friedman has done work in Rwanda on genocide and how we share information across generations so that these kinds of genocides don't happen again. And that's a different kind of memorial. Memorials can also be personal, of course, and linked to making sense of a loss, affirming the life of the deceased, maintaining continuing bonds. The intention can also be to <coughs> foreground groups who've maybe not been memorialised before. So this Second Life Memorial is for international transgender hate crimes and suicide. So it's something that probably wouldn't usually get space in, say, a shopping centre. But on Second Life, there's room to, to open up and enable disenfranchised grief. I know, I think it was Stacey had this photo yesterday. I think we all like Yuri's Thanato Fenestra. So this is one of the few examples of a sacred digital memorial. Um, Yuri used traditional physical rituals drawn from Japanese Buddhist faith and interactions with digital photographs. And he combined them in a new sacred ritual. So it's one of the very few examples where someone's tried to blend the two. They, Paul Coulton, who was here yesterday, he's not been working on memorials, but he's been using um, digital technologies in church churches to kind of, I was going to say bring the church into the 21st century, that's not quite what I mean, but to updating some of the practices. So we designed this framework, but of course, if it's a framework, it's no good unless you actually test it. Otherwise, it's just academics sitting at the desk going, well, that's a good idea. So we tested the framework in a bespoke digital memorial. So I can, there's a link at the end to the papers, but the work is in a, a paper called Story Shell with my co-authors, so Miriam Julius, Elise van den Hoven, and Dave Kirk. So we tested out the framework for a digital memorial. Um, so we set out, we wanted to, t to work just with one person. We were looking for somebody who'd been bereaved in the last five years. And that's specifically because we needed somebody with digital content. Because you can't make a digital memorial if you haven't got digital content to work with. Um, so we produced, well my, my, my talented intern, not me, um, produced these beautiful flyers. We went to um, a public event which was about death and celebrating end of life and people that have passed away. Did lots of networking, lots of handing out leaflets, didn't get anybody at all. Um, but then through personal contacts I had a, a mum volunteer to come and work with us. And the idea was we would do a very participatory piece of work where we would actively involve the, the bereaved person. And it's pretty time consuming, so I don't want to go into too much detail with this, but you know, we set up the study, we recruited, which took a while. We had the mum, and her, her name was Myra. So Myra came into the research studio, we did the consent process, we went to our home for a whole morning. We went to our home again, and then we went out and unexpectedly we went on a hill walk. We visited her at the school. It was her son that had passed away at the age of 15, unexpectedly. We went to his school. We went to the places he used to exercise. She came back into the research studio to look at what we produced. She took the prototype we developed home to test it. And then came back, well we went to, again to Myra's home. Um, and then she came into the studio. So this took about two months end to end. So it was quite an involved process, but at every step of the way, Myra was involved in what we did. But I'll show you what we did. So in the design process between the first interview and the second, we put together some initial ideas um, on themes for the memorial. And this was based on interview one, where we'd found out a lot about Myra's son, and his name was Andrew. So in interview one, we'd found out about the circumstances of his life and death. Uh, we'd found out about his interests. 
We'd also found out a lot about Myra and how she already remembered Andrew and the practices that she engaged in to remember him. So there was a, we did some sort of trying to map out what was important. We'd found out that Andrew really liked running. As a younger boy, he liked drawing, particularly birds. He was in the Marines. He loved his sunglasses. So we put up some mood boards to give Myra choices about even what colours we put into the memorial. We found out also that Myra loved hearing new stories about Andrew. So when we went to the school, the thing that she really enjoyed, we met Andrew's old teachers. Um, and she was really animated when she found out new stories about the kind of things that Andrew got up to on school trips away. So he'd gone to Paris. <coughs> And she found out far more about what he was doing dressed up in the girls' bedrooms. <coughs> and it was all quite above board, it was just hijinks. But she really enjoyed finding out new things that she didn't know about her son. So what we wanted to do was create opportunities to gather new stories that she could then experience. We set up, through Facebook, we set up opportunities for people to record new stories. And the image there is one of the triggers that we used. So Andrew used to go running up on these hills. So there was a series of images put up on Facebook which were curated by Myra. And some of them were digital materials that she already had, so images from Facebook and other social media of Andrew. Um, she also went into her cupboards and pulled out the things that were important to Andrew, like his sunglasses and hat, took photos of them, and we put those onto Facebook. So what was strange was we re she recruited very heavily. She phoned her friends. She asked them to put photos up. She sent messages to Andrew's friends. Nobody recorded the story. We don't know why, but I'll tell you what we did towards the end. But in the meantime, while we were trying to get the stories, we started to design the artifact that would be the memorial. And Myra is a very cuddly person. I mean, she's the only participant I've ever had who hugs me and kisses me when I turn up. So it wasn't appropriate to give her an app. I mean, it just wouldn't have made any sense. So we wanted something that was nice to hold. And Miriam, who was the intern, piloted various papier-mâché shapes that were something that was good to hold. And we knew from Myra that when she thought about Andrew, the two ways she thought about him deeply was one was going for a walk to his grave, and the other was when she had a quiet time in the house and she would sit. So we wanted something that would really draw her gaze in, help her to focus. So we had this great idea that we would have a digital device with a candle in it, which we realised was not particularly safe. So we, we updated on that one. Amongst the stories that Miriam told us, she told us about Andrew running on these hills where we went for a hill walk unexpectedly. Um, so part of the interior of this orb shape that we created was a laser cut interior and the, the outline here, or the ups and downs, is actually the skyline of the hills that Andrew used to run on. And he was also very keen on birds, so the, there's a kind of a feathering effect as well. So there's a, there was a lot of symbolism in the interior so Mara could look into this orb that we created and be stimulated to remember things about Andrew that she was really proud of. It's a digital memorial, so there's got to be some technology embedded in it. Um, so this was hidden away underneath. It was kind of stuffed in so, some Arduino technology plus sensors. And this technology was designed to have remote access to the internet to pick up the stories that we hoped friends and family would leave about Andrew. And the way that it worked was that when you touched, I'll show you a picture of the um, full memorial in a minute, but it was touch activated, so when you held this orb that was the memorial, it automatically triggered narration of stories, was the idea. So Miriam did a, a beautiful job of putting together this orb, which was 3D printed. So we used technology to develop the outer casing. Um, we tried to do the interior with 3D printing, but it just took too long because it was too complicated. So there's still limitations on the technology.
rather than having a candle, we put LED lights inside the memorial so we didn't burn the thing. But the idea was very much to draw Myra's gaze in, to give her opportunities for reflection, and while she held it, to have these story, stories triggered. I think the other, the other thing to note was the, um, we were particularly keen on having lights in it. Myra is Mexican. So in her first visit, she showed us pictures of her um, shrine that she used on the Mexican Day of the Dead for Andrew. She actually has two because he died at 15, so she has one for him, him as a child and one for him as an adult. So we did integrate some elements of the traditions of the Day of the Dead into the memorial through the lights. But we kind of skipped on things like marigolds because we thought it was a bit obvious. So as I said, friends and family didn't record stories. And it ended up that Myra recorded stories instead. And at the start of this process, Myra had said that she wanted to record the story so her, her other son, who was younger, remembered Andrew. So she wanted this memorial to be a, a, an artifact that she would pass on to her son that would help him with his memories of Andrew. So we expect when Myra offered to do stories that she would talk to her surviving son. She didn't, she talked to Andrew, which was, we were kind of surprised, but it was actually very intimate. And she said it had taken her a long time. So she sat and she said she tried a few times and then suddenly she just had this run at recording stories of her memories of him. But she spoke directly to Andrew. And it was, I found it very difficult to listen to it because it was very moving